Good afternoon and happy Sabbath to everyone. <clears throat> the sermon I'm doing today is faith and trust. Faith is attitude, conviction, as well as conduct. It's based on our relationship with God. Our faith grows in both strength and depth as we nourish our relationship with our, <coughs> our Creator throughout our lives. I'd like to begin with Proverbs 3, 5, and 7. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. We are to trust God with all of our hearts, and not depend on, on what we know. We should include God in all that we do. By us doing so, we give him the opportunity to keep us on the right path. As we may not know what lies ahead, the Lord tells us not to rely on our own wisdom, as we are not to act recklessly or without thought. And then I go to Mark 10, 27. And Jesus looking upon him said, <clears throat> With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. <clears throat> Jesus explains that it, it's impossible for us to inherit eternal life on our own, as only God can save us, as Paul explains this more clearly. For by grace you are saved through faith. This is not done by our own doing. It's a gift from God. It's not a result of works. Everyone who is, has been, or will be saved is saved by grace through faith. Now I'd like to go to Luke 137. <clears throat> For with God, <clears throat> nothing shall be impossible. Anything that's done is well within God's ability. His powers alone create everything. <clears throat> which is our <clears throat> excuse me, which is our will ever be. This simple statement is an awesome sign of hope brought by faith in God. Such has changed lives, victory in hand, circumstances, overcoming sin, even eternal salvation. These things are very much possible through relationship with Jesus Christ. Now go to Romans ten. 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Anything that's done is well within God's ability. His power alone created everything, which is our <coughs> whoever be. This simple statement is an awesome sign of hope brought by faith in God, such as changed lives, victory in hard circumstances, overcoming sin, even eternal salvation. These things are very much possible through relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay, let me go to, let's see, let me go to here. Let me go to 2 Corinthians 4.18. While we look not at the things we, which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are, te are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul adds that this perspective, <coughs> perspective requires a focus on what cannot be seen in this life, meaning the spiritual word, world. Things that are visible to humans in this life are here for just a moment, and then are gone. The invisible God, <clears throat> though is eternal, meaning outside of time. Whatever exists with God is the spiritual world will never end. Set your hearts and minds on, on things above and not on earthly things. Paul sums up in this verse, they, <clears throat> they walk, meaning here is to live or make a habit by faith and not that by a sight. Hebrews 1 through 3. Excuse me, leave Hebrews 11. Okay. 
Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain the good report. Through faith we understand that the words were framed by the, the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The assurance and conviction of faith is not blind assumption, nor gullibility, nor visual thinking. Faith is a choice to follow God with all of our confidence. Thank you. I'm going to begin in John 14. John 14, verse 1, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, why did Jesus say that? Well, you have to remember the scene. They were at the Last Supper. That was for them the Passover. Jesus just instituted the new covenant with bread and wine representing his body and blood. Then he told them he would be betrayed by one of them. Then he said he was going away and they could not follow him. Then Peter said he would lay down his life for Jesus, but Jesus said Peter would deny that he even knew him three times before the rooster crowed that morning. But don't be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Where is the Father's house with many mansions? We're going to uh, bounce around a little bit today. Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. Verse 6, But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm to the end. We are the house. We go back to 1 Corinthians and chapter 3 and verse 16 he says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? We are the temple of God we are the house of God so again back in John 14 verse 2 in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also the word mansions means dwelling places. We are collectively the many places where God dwells because he dwells in each one of us. He said he was going to prepare a place. Remember what he told Peter and John. Go back a few pages to Luke 22. Luke 22 and verse 8. And he sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? Verse 12 says, Then he will show you a large furnished upper room there make ready. So they went and found it just as he said, and they prepared the Passover. So Peter and John went to make ready to prepare a place to set things up. When we come to services, we need to prepare the place. 
we need to set things up. You know, whether it's tables and chairs, the PA, the camera, the coffee, the stuff for the kitchen, we need to prepare the place before everybody shelves up. And that's what he told them to do. Well, Jesus says he's going to set things up. He's going to prepare. He's going to be setting things in motion. Now, if we look at John chapter 7 and verse 39, it says, But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus had to die and be resurrected as a spirit being as the Son of God. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 32. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Once Jesus was glorified, they could put in motion the next phase of their plan on Pentecost. In type, Jesus came again on Pentecost by pouring out his Holy Spirit, preparing us for when he comes again at the last trump for the ultimate fulfillment when he will receive us up into the clouds to be with him and then to set up the kingdom of God that where he is, we may be also. He had to die to be resurrected and to go away back to heaven for us. The place that was being prepared was us. On Pentecost, it began for mankind in general. Repent, be baptized, and then receive the Holy Spirit. We had to be prepared to receive his Holy Spirit by first repenting and then by being baptized. Only then were we prepared to receive God's Spirit and become his children. Once Jesus was once again glorified, all of this could happen. Back in John 14, verse 4, And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Well, first of all, where was he going? Well, he told them earlier, John chapter 6, verse 62, he says, What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? Which was where? Verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So he's telling them he's going back to heaven, back to the Father. He said he is the way. The only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ. He is the truth. He is the life. Again in chapter 6 and verse 63, he says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. And then again in chapter 8, and verse 14, Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. 
And yet, if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Again, he says the truth. And in chapter 1, and verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And verse 17, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. Back in John 14 again, verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? So, if we look at a couple of verses, it gives us an idea. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And then in Hebrews chapter 1, I'm sure you're all familiar with. And in verse 1, it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The express image of God's person. To us, it would be like twins. If you've seen the Father, you've seen the Son. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. They're just like looking at twins. Back in John 14, once again, in verse 10, he says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. The Father is in Christ, and Christ is in the Father. Now, again, he uses physical things to try and help us understand the spiritual. So physically, we know when the baby is in the womb, the baby is in the mother, but the mother is also in the baby because all the nourishment the baby gets comes from the mother. So I am in the baby and the baby is in me, is what the mother could say. That's what he's trying to tell us. And Jesus said, I and my father are one back in John 10 verse 30. Now he tells them plainly he is going to his father and because of that they will do great works. Verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name that I will do that the father may be glorified in the son. If you ask anything in my name I will do it. If you love me keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him, 
nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Jesus is trying to explain to them he is going away, but will be back as a spirit. Of course, everything that he's telling them and has been telling them is like brand new. It's like they were babies and they're learning things that they never knew, never heard of. He is the helper. He is the spirit of truth that the world cannot receive. Why? Because the world doesn't know him. But we know him, and they knew him, and saw him, and dwelt with him, and he would be in them. He did not leave them orphans, but he came to them in the spirit. Verse 19, a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. Jesus said the same thing in verse 11, I in my father and my father in me. Now he says, we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. Verse 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. If we love God and show it by keeping his commandments, the Father and Christ will make their home with us, because we are the many mansions. The word home there in King James is abode, and it's the exact same word as mansions used back in verse 2. Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 tells us the same thing. It says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, which was the Father, dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The spirit of Christ and the Father are in us. Now, Paul wasn't there at that time to hear Jesus say that, but he was taught by Christ after his conversion. That's how he knows these things. And it agrees exactly with what Jesus was telling the disciples on that evening. Back in John 14, in verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. The Helper, or the comforter is the Greek 3875 which is parakletos hold your place here and turn over with me to John 1st John chapter 2 
1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate, a helper, a comforter, parakletos, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The same word, the same person. But it's also more than that. If you look that up, it also says counselor. Now, Remember where you heard that before? Again in John 14, go back and look at verse 7. It says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. But Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father, so how can you say, Show us the Father. You've seen the Father, you've seen me. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus may have been telling them something else that they would not comprehend until later. If we go back to Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, which it was back in Judges, Counselor, which is the same word as Comforter, Helper, Advocate, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So he is called the Counselor, the Helper, the Comforter, the Advocate. But he is also called the Everlasting Father. Now how is that? Well, if we go over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. He says, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So the God of the Old Testament, the one known as Jesus Christ, was in the prophets. To David, to Daniel, to Moses, to Elijah, Christ is their father. His spirit was in them. And now since the father is in Christ and Christ is in the father, will the one that Jesus Christ revealed as the father become their grandfather as we reckon family members? Back in John 14, once again, in verse 27, he says, Peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So he says again what he said in verse 1. Don't be afraid. Yeah, he's telling them things that they had no idea, no understanding of he says don't don't be afraid you know don't be shaken don't get worried upset you have heard me say to you I am going away and coming back to you if you love me you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the father for my father is greater than I so once again he tells them he's going to the father and now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass you may believe. And that is one of the main purposes of prophecy. That when it comes to pass, you will believe and trust in God 
and believe he is in control. Now back in verse 13 and 14, he says, whatever we ask, we will have. That is, whatever we ask him to do, he will do. Now, of course, we need to understand that he knows what is best for us. Even though we may not agree or understand his purpose or reason for his response. Over in James, it says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss. Because you're going to spend it on your lust or whatever, your own desires. And, and I think, you know, all of us at one time or another would sure wish we could have a million dollars. Would sure solve a lot of problems. And, but at the same time, what problems would it create? A lot of times when everything is going great, you, God kind of takes a back seat. We don't need you right now. I got everything. I, 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 everything's just great, wonderful. You know? uh, and a lot of times that's why things don't happen. We don't always get what we ask for. You know, we ask for healing. Some get healed. Some don't. Some get better. Some suffer. We wonder why. Sometimes it's so we pray more and draw closer to God. And sometimes it might just be to see how soon that you walk away from God if you don't get what you want. How strong is our love, our trust, and our faith? You know, Jesus made the comment, when he returns, will he really find faith, faith on the earth? Probably not. Because anybody with any faith is going to be up in the clouds with him. There won't be anybody with any faith left standing around. You know, when we, when we look at the broad picture and we look at things, but we have to ask, was Christ delivered? Did he get what he prayed for? He said, if there's some other way that we can do this some other way, but not my will, yours be done. Did he suffer? Yep. And yet the Bible tells us in Romans that we will be glorified with him if we suffer. Yet he knew and we know that our Father was there for him and that there was a plan and a purpose. You know, they drew this plan out <laughs> how many years ago? before the foundation of the world that says Christ was slain. So they, they knew what the plan was going to be all the way back. They knew that man wasn't going to repent, that God was going to have to come down as a man and suffer and die because that's the way that they wrote the law in order for us to be saved. We needed a Savior. And it had to be God himself to save us. Yeah, but some of these verses here were directed mainly at the disciples and don't necessarily translate to everybody that reads them. In verse 12, he said, greater works they would do. Well, let's take a look at some of the works that they did. Back in Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1 says, When he had called his twelve disciples to them, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, and he reads off the names of the apostles. And verse 4, Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These 
12, Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. He gave them power. He gave them authority to use the power. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 1, it repeats that it says, And he called the twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. And then in Luke chapter 10 and verse 1, it says, After these things the Lord appointed seventy others also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And then in verse 17, the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And then in verse 23, then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are your eyes, which the things you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear, and have not heard it. They were given authority and power. You know, you can get power, but if you don't have the authority to use that power, you can't use it. In a conversation, just to kind of give you an example, with uh, a member years ago, with a, how should I say, a wrong attitude, which came out in the conversation, he made the statement that he ain't waiting for no second resurrection. So when he comes in the first resurrection, and he's changed into a spirit being, he's gonna go and resurrect his family members. I said, no, there's a plan, and you're gonna to have to abide by the plan. You may have the power, you will not have the authority. And that's the difference. You can't just do what you want because you get the power, guess what? You're not gonna be there. It's not gonna happen. So you better get your attitude straight and understand there's a plan and there's a purpose. They were given power and authority. God put in their control to heal, to cast out demons, to raise the dead. They even said that the demons were subject to us in your name. Now think what you could do if you had that power. If you had that kind of power, just think of what you could do. You, know, you could, on your way home, you stop at the hospital and empty the place. And all the doctors, nurses would have to go have a coffee break. I'd wait for the next ambulance to come in. I mean, you, your, your, your imagination could just go with all the things that you could do, you know, if you had that kind of power. What's one of the first things you you would want to do? You'd want to drive down to St. Jude's and heal all them kids suffering from cancer. Well, they did have that power. Even Judas Iscariot had the power, and they experienced those miracles, and yet experiencing those miracles and using that power was not enough for Judas to control his bad attitude and allow Satan's influences. The heart is deceitful. 
they were allowed to see and hear things prophets and kings were not. They had available to them the same spirit that we do. We turn over to Galatians. Uh, Galatians chapter 5. Verse 22, which you know by heart. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. The first thing we have to do is develop the character of God. Then we can use the gifts. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 1, he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Verse 4, There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. In other words, not everybody has the same job in the ministry. You know, your job may be this, and somebody else's job is over that. But there are diversities of activities. That's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So what gifts did the apostles have? All of them, to differing degrees. Some of them did more healings, some of them did more prophesying, prophesying. You know, if, they had different gifts, but they all had knowledge, wisdom, faith. Peter and John in Acts 3 healed a lame man. And it talks about him being healed, and then over in chapter 4, it was called a miracle of healing. That's the way the... Uh, Pharisees says, what are we going to do with these guys? Because it's evident this miracle of healing, <laughs> and yet, what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to punish him. God gave them the gifts and the authority to use them to preach the gospel and to feed the church. The gifts are still here. Although maybe not to the degree of the first century, when God was calling by the thousands regularly. And you read the first few chapters of Acts. Was it 3,000 one day? The next time it was 5,000. You know, it just, it was big groups on a regular basis. And God gave them the authority to do this as a witness that they had power from God in order to preach the gospel with the power. Some things they just couldn't do. If we look over just for one little verse over here in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 25, Uh, Paul is talking, he says, Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. A night and a day in the deep. Paul would have loved to be able to walk on water. I'm sure he would have rather have been able to just walk around for a night and a day on the water as opposed to trying to hold on to a piece of driftwood or something and float around out there. 
but it wasn't necessary to preach the gospel. Christ is in us, but we're not all powerful, even though we are children of God. The baby in the womb is every bit human, but doesn't have any power. Even when the baby is born, he or she needs to learn. Can't do anything but lay there and cry completely helpless. You have to do everything for that baby. We still have healings. We still have miracles. God still answers our prayers and he does things for us even though we may not recognize it or remember it. You ever been uh, praying for something? Asking God for something you already got? Because you forgot. He did that for you last month. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> it happens. But the time is coming when God will once again show his power. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 3 he says I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must in this manner be killed. And of course that references back to the time when the prophet said, uh, well, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you in your 50. That was fire coming out of his mouth. He spoke the word, fire came down and burned them all up. They're going to have that kind of power. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as, man, as, all plagues as often as they desire. So a three and a half year drought and the water that's left turned to blood and then have some plagues on top of that. They're going to have the power. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Verse 10, And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. The world will be affected by their power. The whole world. They're going to be so glad that they're dead because they wouldn't listen to the message. They wouldn't change. They wouldn't obey. They wouldn't believe the love of the truth that they might be saved. As we near the tribulation, the end time, as we enter the beginning of sorrows soon, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe his word. Christ is in us and we are in Christ. One last scripture. 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 17. Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We, the real us, each one of us, is a new 
creation waiting to be born. Just like the baby in the womb. We are the many mansions, the house of God, the temple of God, their abode. As Jesus said to the Father, you and me, I and them. We have the spirit of truth that the world does not have and can't have because they don't know him. And they can't know him because they won't obey him. He makes it very plain. If you love me, prove it. Keep my commandments. 